All right, we are live. So hi everyone, my name is Martin. I'm the chair of this session and the next. Um, and the uh, first, uh, so the next session is an invited talk uh, to be given by Dustin Moody from NIST. And he's going to give us an update on the post-quantum process um, by uh, NIST. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Martin. Let me uh, share the slides. Hopefully that's working and everybody can see that. So on behalf of NIST and the post-quantum team, I'd like to thank Real World Crypto for inviting us to give an update on our competition. Um, I'll rewind back two years ago. Uh, Real World Crypto similarly invited us. It was at the end of our first round and we were going to announce the candidates for the second round of our NIST um, post-quantum competition. And we were invited to come do that at Real World Crypto. Uh, you may or may not remember, but shortly before that happened, uh, the U.S. government went into a shutdown. So being a government employee, we were not allowed to come and give that presentation. So I'm glad here two years later, I'm, I'm able to participate, even though there's a pandemic and it's virtual, it's uh, good to be here. So of course, everyone is probably aware of the, the threat that quantum computers pose. Um, at NIST, we're most worried about it in regards to our, our three public key crypto standards that we have. We have two of them that deal with public key encryption or key establishment. Those are SB 856A and 56B. And then we also have a, a public key digital signature standard in FIPS 186. And these would be the ones that would be most vulnerable to attacks from a quantum computer, uh, namely Shor's algorithm, which would break all the algorithms that we use today for public key, namely RSA, DSA, ECDSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and so forth. And so we need to completely replace the algorithms in these standards. We have many other crypto standards and there would be impacts from a quantum computer, but the impact is less dramatic. We would be able to use longer keys, use longer hash function output, et cetera, which is easier to manage than having to select a, a whole new algorithm. So that's what this project is, this post-quantum cryptography project. Um, we want to ensure that the crypto we are using today will be secure from both classical computing technology as well as future quantum computers. And even though we don't yet have a large-scale working quantum computer, uh, we know that we need to begin working on this problem well in advance of that. And that's best explained by uh, this theorem from Dr. Michele Mosca that has been widely seen as well that helps us understand that even without a quantum computer here, somebody could take your data, which is encrypted, and just hold on to it and wait until uh, Z years later when, you, when they, a quantum computer comes out, and then they'll be able to get access to your data well before the, you, know, you want your information to be revealed. And so it's displayed here in forms where you could put in numbers for X, Y, and Z for your organization and see, you know, do you have a problem now? And if you want to protect your information for any length of time, yeah, uh, we need to worry about this now. Now, the big question is, what is Z? Um, how long until we have a quantum computer? Um, it's not exactly my field. I'm not a physicist or in quantum mechanics or anything. Um, so for that, we have to turn to what the experts say. And I'm copying here a, a chart from a publication of Dr. Mosca and one of his co-authors, uh, Piani, from a little over a year ago. Uh, they surveyed 22 experts in the field and asked them what, what would be the, their opinion of when we would have a quantum computer that's large enough that would threaten public key crypto. And so if you look at this chart for a little bit, the first row is they put odds on would we have one in five years? And you can see that um, most of them thought it would be less than a 1% chance. But as we go down a couple rows to 10 years, 15 years, we see more of these experts believe that there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a chance we could have a large-scale quantum computer that would be breaking cryptography. Of course, nobody knows for sure. This is all just speculation, but it just goes to uh, give you some estimates on a possible time frame of 10 to 15 years is, you know, a rough time frame when this could, could be something uh, where we'd have a quantum computer around that time. 
At NIST, we've been worried about this for quite some time, uh, well before 2016. Uh, we held a workshop um, back in 2015 and uh, had a survey paper we pub put out back in, I think, 2010. But in terms of our competition, it really started five years ago in 2016. That's where we, we first announced at uh, PQ Crypto in Japan that we would be doing this post-quantum competition. And we put out the requirements and the evaluation criteria we would be using. Since then, we've had uh, two rounds. Uh, we received a large number of submissions. And I'll, in the slides coming up here, I'll quickly summarize those first two rounds. But right now, where we are is we're in the, the middle of the, the third round, where we have uh, 15 algorithms that we're still considering. Um, for each of the previous two rounds, we've issued reports. Um, the, you can see them highlighted here. If you just Google NISTER 8240 or 8309, you can see our report on each round and how we selected the algorithms to move on and, and so forth. So the evaluation criteria that we are using, um, the, the two main criteria are security and performance. And again, security, we need to be secure against both classical and quantum attacks. And for some algorithms, uh, setting your parameters, the classical attacks are actually the ones that uh, are most relevant. We defined five security categories so that when submitters were creating their parameter sets and wanting to uh, show how much security they offered, that they would have a, a uniform framework to compare them against each other, and we would have that as well. Um, level one means you're at least as hard to break as AES using an exhaustive key search. And the other levels are similarly tied to some of the symmetric key crypto that we have standardized at NIST already. Uh, we think that levels one, two, and three will be enough for the next several decades. Um, and we also have levels four and five for applications that need very high security and to see how key sizes and so forth scale as you increase your parameters. So security is always uh, top priority for cryptography. After security, there's performance, and that would be measured on a variety of, of classical platforms, both low-end and high-end uh, software and, and hardware. This includes both the efficiency, like how fast you can encrypt and decrypt, um, as well as the size, like what's the public key size, what's the signature size, cybertech size, etc. And then beyond these two main criteria, there's a number of other properties that it would be nice to have, you know, as much as possible a drop in replacement, provide perfect word secrecy, uh, be side channel resistant, um, and so on and so forth. So there's kind of a laundry list of desirable properties, knowing that it's probably not possible to have, you know, absolutely everything here. There's no silver bullet that solves all the problems. So in the first round, we had 82 schemes that were submitted to us. 69 of them met our requirements. Um, five withdrew pretty quickly after they were broken. So for most of the first round, we were left with 64 algorithms in play. Uh, you can see in the table in the bottom right, uh, for the most part, they followed the established lines of research that the community was well aware of. Uh, so there was a lot of lattice-based submissions, a lot of code-based submissions and several multivariate signatures, as well as some other uh, ideas out there, such as stateless hash, isogenies, and, and so on. I think it was a lot of fun for cryptographers right after we published this, you know, here's 60 some schemes to, uh, to attack. So cryptographers quickly went to work, and just in the first, I'd say, month or so, you know, they'd broken probably uh, about 20 of the, the 69 that were out there. Um, so that was a lot of fun to see. We held a workshop where we invited all the, the round one participants to come and to explain their, their strengths of their algorithm. So that had a large number of presentations. It was held in Florida, a very nice venue. We established the, the PQC forum and had a lot of discussion, a lot of questions, a lot of posting, a lot of official comments on there. And that's still very active today. And you can look up those archives and, and see what people were talking about. There's a lot of research, a lot of performance numbers in the first round. And after about a year, um, once our government shutdown ended, uh, we selected 26 of the most promising schemes to move on into the, the second round. 
Uh, that included four submissions that were mergers from the first round. Um, there had been a lot of very similar submissions, particularly in the lattice chems, so it was, it was good to see that we had some mergers going on. For the most part, we maintained the diversity of the algorithms from the first round, but we needed to uh, choose smaller numbers so that people could focus on. Uh, we held a workshop uh, co-located with Crypto out in California, and that was a good workshop. A lot of people attended that. And as could be expected, cryptanalysis continued even in the second round. Uh, these were the 26 of the, the more promising schemes, but even, even then, seven of them were broken or significantly attacked in the second round. And we're also glad to see even more bench benchmarking, more performance numbers, um, and, and experiments that were being done where they were taking some of these algorithms and putting them into real world experiments, into protocols and testing them out to see how would they perform. After 18 months, uh, we selected 15 submissions to move on into the third round. And that was a, a really difficult decision process. It took us a while to, to settle on that. So looking back at the first round candidates, here are, um, they all listed. If you're involved in attacking some of them, you may see some familiar names among them. Um, it's kind of fun to see the, the names everybody chooses. For the second round, I crossed out the ones that did not make it. Um, the ones in orange were mergers. They merged together to make it into the second round. So I wanted to highlight that they did survive. And the ones in green are the ones that made it into the, the second round. So some of those names hopefully look uh, familiar as we've been studying them over the past while. As I said, it was a very difficult decision selecting the schemes to move on into the third round. Um, we, we kept in mind our, our evaluation criteria, criteria in terms of security and performance, as well as other issues as well, implementation characteristics um, and so forth. Uh, each round, Teams were allowed to make changes, so we, we looked at what those changes were and were they improving the submission, as well as, again, the, the discussion on the PQC forum and the research and performance numbers that were published. And for the third round, we decided to do something different than we've done in the past. We decided to use two different tracks of, of algorithms moving on. Um, and that was a not an easy decision even just doing that. There, there's trade-offs to doing it this way, but ultimately we needed to narrow down the number so that we could focus on the most promising algorithms, but we also felt that there were a number of algorithms that still could potentially be standardized. Uh, PQC is still a very much an active research area. The science is not yet settled and we don't want to rule anything out yet. So we thought this was the best way to kind of balance those interests. Uh, the first track we called finalists, we thought that they were the algorithms that would be most likely to be ready at the end of the third round for standardization, and that they would be the most promising ones to fit the majority of the use cases. The algorithms that were not finalists, we called alternates, and the crucial point for us there was we didn't want to keep an algorithm around just because we thought it was interesting and we thought people should keep researching it, we only wanted to keep it around if we saw a potential avenue for standardization. That wasn't a promise that it would be standardized, but just um, we saw a path where, where it could be. So for the third round, the seven finalists and eight alternates that we still have in there, uh, the chem finalists are Kyber, Entru, and Saber in classic McLeese. The signature finalists are Dilithium, Falcon, and Rainbow. The chem alternates are Bike, Frodo, HQC, Entry Prime, and Psych. And the signature alternates are Gems, Picnic, and Sphinx Plus. And again, we, we tried to maintain the diversity of the algorithms as well as reducing the number down. Um, but they were some, some very difficult decisions and we had to eliminate some, some good schemes in order to narrow things down. Just to kind of give a quick summary on um, these schemes, these are the five lattice-based chems that are still around in the third round. Uh, the finalists, Kyber, Saber, and Entru are all based on structured lattices. Um, as such, they have pretty good all-around performance. Uh, key sizes aren't too large, they're pretty efficient. 
Entru is a little different than Kyber and Saber in that it, it's a little bit older, has a clear IP situation, is based on a different security problem. So we, we do have some diversity among these three. But uh, as they're all structured lattice ones, we expect to choose at most one of those three at the end of round three for standardization. Um, we also had as alternates, we had Entru Prime. It is a structured lattice scheme that made kind of different design choices and it is, is interesting. Um, but we did not put it as a finalist. And then Frodo chose uh, some security performance trade-offs that perhaps is uh, more conservative, but it took a little bit of a hit in performance. So we see it as a more conservative solution or as a backup, um, which is available to us if we need. The other chems, three of them are code-based. Um, Classic McLeese, which we selected as a finalist, it's been around a long time. Has very large public keys, but the ciphertexts are the smallest out of all chems. So for some applications, you know, you might be able to manage the, the keys and take advantage of the small ciphertexts. Um, we really like Bike and HQC, but we we thought they needed a little bit more time to iron out some of their the details that they're still working on. So they're they're two good code-based uh, schemes that will likely uh, continue to be worked on and improved. And then there's also Psych. We heard uh, about it during Luca's talk. Um, it's based on isogenies, which is a newer problem. It's a little bit slower in performance, but it has the advantage of having small keys. So, you know, for some applications, that, that could be a win. And we have it there as an alternate to, to continue being looked at. For our signatures, we have six signatures still in Dilithium and Falcon are both uh, lattice based based on structured lattices. So similar to the chem situation, uh, their key sizes look pretty good. They're both pretty efficient. And we will select at most one of them to be uh, standardized at the end of the third round. Uh, we also have Sphinx Plus and Picnic. They're based on kind of different ideas. Sphinx Plus is based on uh, hash-based signatures. It's a very stable, conservative design. Uh, we, we understand the security well. It's a bit larger and slower than some of its competitors. So for that reason, it was chosen as an alternate. A picnic has a lot of potential, um, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on it. So we selected it as an alternate. And then we had two multivariate schemes, rainbow and gems, um, based on different problems in multivariate, um, but they have a similar profile and they have very large public keys and very small signatures. Um, in comparing the two, we thought Rainbow was a little bit better and that it's uh, small signatures for some applications that could be useful. And in order to have some diversity and not depend entirely on lattices, we selected Rainbow as a finalist. Now, even in round three, cryptanalysis is continuing, uh, particularly for uh, the two multivariate signature schemes, Rainbow and Gems. Uh, they both have had some attacks from some new MinRank style attacks due to uh, Boyens and Tao, Petzold and Ding. This all came after our end of the second round decision making, um, but we're very much uh, aware of what's going on now. A rainbow seems to lose a little bit less security than gems. Um, and just last week, the rainbow team responded with a new security analysis where they uh, go into some more details about memory costs and explain that they still feel that they are still at their same security levels despite the, the attack, which, which they did confirm is correct. So that needs to be looked at and evaluated. Um, but when we look at the, the state of the signature schemes, we have six signature schemes and uh, two of them in multivariate have had some attacks. That gives us some concern at NIST and probably to the crypto community as well. You know, we don't want to have all our eggs in just one basket. Um, so we want diversity for security problems as well as for, for application reasons as well. And so we wanted to highlight two quotes from our second round report. Uh, we're thinking a lot about this situation internally and we hope other people as well. Uh, the first paragraph points out that Sphinx is an extremely conservative choice and um, if confidence in better performing signature algorithms is shaken, you know, Sphinx potentially could be ready at the end of the third round as well, even though it's an alternate. So that's, that's not saying we're necessarily going to do that. We just wanted to point out that um, that is a possibility. 
And the second paragraph where we talked about, um, we may adopt in the future a mechanism to accept new proposals at a later date. In particular, we might be interested in general purpose digital signatures, which are not based on structured lattices. And again, we're not promising or committing that we will be accepting more, uh, more signature schemes, but this is something we're thinking about and we would appreciate getting input from the cryptographic community um, on the state of the signature schemes like I've talked about here. So our timeline, we've been going for uh, almost six months in the third round and it's expected that it'll last a year to 18 months, after which we'll select some of the algorithms to standardize. We do expect to have a fourth round where we will continue to study some of the alternates and uh, maybe after the fourth round they will be ready for standardization. It, it would similarly be like the first three rounds, it would be uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, we are working on a workshop planning the logistics of it right now. It'll be virtual and it, it's looking like it will be late May or early June and we hope pretty soon to, to have concrete dates for you. Overall, our timeline, we still expect to be what we've been saying from the beginning. We expect to, to have the first draft standards ready for public comment in 2022 to 2023. It, it does take a little bit of time to write them and to get public feedback on it and to get it through the bureaucratic process, which we need to go through. Um, but we, we expect that the final standard should hopefully be, uh, or not the final, the finalized standard would be ready by about 2024. So there's, there are plenty of research challenges still open. Um, I'm not gonna go through these in detail or anything. There's, there's more general topics as well as questions specific for, for certain of the round three algorithms. Um, I'll uh, let people just work on those as they will without going into detail right now. As well as there's other challenges besides um, research. Um, IP is a, a concern. Uh, we share the, the feeling, which most of the community does as well, that we want anything we standardize to be able to be freely used. So we're, we're actively working on that. We want benchmarking to continue, both in hardware and software. Um, we want people working on side channel resistant implementations of the algorithms. and. We like the real world experiments that we've seen so far so that we, we can see if uh, they work. Are our, our key sizes too large? Are they too slow? Things like that. We also want to continue to encourage, as people are already doing, to think about the transition and what they can do to prepare ahead of time. One idea that is frequently mentioned is using hybrid solutions, and that's the idea of combining a, a classical algorithm with a post-quantum algorithm in such a way that uh, you have to break both of them in order to, to break the hybrid. Uh, a few months back, we allowed this in one of our standards. Um, basically, you can concatenate the shared secret that you obtain from a NIST algorithm and a quantum resistant algorithm, and then you run it through a KDF, and we explain how to do that in such a way, and, and then the result can still be FIPS validated. Um, it's only validating the classical part because that's the only thing currently standardized, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it would allow input from a quantum resistant algorithm as well. And of course, we'll have more to say about the transition in, in future years as, as we start selecting algorithms. Um, we've published transition guidelines in the past. You know, we've done this for triple key DES, for SHA-1, um, and so forth. And we will, of course, do so for post-quantum standards in the next few years. Um, I want to point out the uh, National Cybersecurity of Excellence recently hosted a workshop in October about some of these issues regarding the uh, transition and hybrid and what we can be doing to, to better prepare. And they're still actively working on this project. So if you're interested, um, they're leading that. We're working with them as well. But I'd invite you to get involved with that project as well. Um, stateful hash space signatures were outside of the scope of our competition. Uh, they have been standardized in the IETF with two RFCs, which standardize XMSS and LMS signatures. NIST recently also standardized the same two algorithms in SP800-208. Um, so there are stateful hash space signatures that are standardized and can be used. Uh, we want to, to caution they are not general purpose digital signature algorithms and should only be used in applications where you can carefully manage the state. Um, otherwise, you can have some pretty disastrous results. 
So in the standard, we point out some uh, warnings on that, but uh, they are available. There are some things that organizations can start to do now um, to prepare, even though we have not yet selected the algorithms. Primarily, you want to just start looking at what crypto you know, you're actually using, which, which algorithms are your public key ones. Can you start doing things to prepare for a transition knowing that it's going to occur? Uh, make sure the products you're using, the, the, you know, that your vendors are aware of the coming transition. And just be tracking what's going on with our project as well as in other areas and with other standards organizations as well as uh, developments of quantum computers to know how they're advancing and so on. With the main goal being that the sooner you're aware and start doing your homework and preparing, you know, you're, you're less likely to have mistakes in the future. So with that, I'll uh, conclude. We're not at the end of this, but we can start to see some of the light at the end of the tunnel. It's going to be a long tunnel, um, but the third round is, you know, not too far off from ending. NIST is grateful for the efforts of everybody. We certainly could not do this on our own, and we appreciate all the, the hard work and research that everybody does. Uh, that includes other standards organizations who are working on this and, and collaborating and cooperating with us so that we have a, a great unified effort. And then I've got the info there for uh, you know, where to get more information. And I'd recommend you, you sign up for the PQC forum if you haven't to stay aware of announcements and discussion on that topic. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions in the time remaining. All right. Thank you so much, Dustin, for a fascinating talk. Uh, there are indeed a bunch of questions uh, in the chat, and we have a whooping three minutes. Uh, so in light of this, I will prioritize those questions. Yeah, may that I for just a moment? I wanted to launch this poll that Dustin had put up. While you take the questions, let's try to take that poll that Dustin had put up at the beginning. Go ahead with the questions. OK, cool. Uh, so I will, I will prioritize the questions that uh, Daniel hasn't already uh, uh, engaged with on Zulip. Kenny asks, to what extent will NIST use secondary security criteria such as PKE robustness to decide between the finalists? Um, we try and consider everything when we, we weigh these factors. So uh, it's hard to put a you know a concrete way as to how we weigh everything. But yeah, all these other secondary issues, we're aware of them. It's good if people talk to us and remind us of them. But we do try and weigh everything, yes. Then uh, Cass is asking, uh, so is you're requiring existential unforgeability. Well, we've known for years that we can do better, strong unforgeability, exclusive ownership, and so on. Do you know how this requirement came about historically? Was it an explicit choice to require only weakish graphic definition or just an accident? Um, remembering back, we made this requirement back in 2016, so it was five years ago, and we debated which security models to use, and then we put that out for public comment, and we tried to uh, respond to the public comments we received. I don't remember a lot of the exact discussion, but of course, teams have been able to update their security proofs and provide the best security proofs and models that they can. You know, Those were kind of the minimum definitions that we required in order to be accepted. All right, let me do one more question uh, by Frey, but let me remind everyone there's more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so does NIST provide a service to the community, uh, the advice of real patent lawyers to evaluate the potential problems IP issues for lattice-based geeks? Um, all the IP stuff, I'm not a lawyer, but we're working kind of behind the scenes to get some of these concerns um, that we're aware of taken care of. And, we're confident that by the end of the third round, anything we select, we will have cleared up by that time. All right. Um, so I think at this point, uh, we should uh, thank uh, Dustin again for a great talk. And everybody, please head to the chat to see kind of the other questions that I unfortunately had to skip over. And I believe we are moving directly into uh, the post quantum session. So the first talk of which, so we have three talks. They're all focused on implementation in the broader sense um, of post-quantum cryptography, exciting talks. First talk is jointly given by Daniel and James on attacks on the NIST uh, round three candidates.
Great, thank you. Um, James, are you here? Just checking in. Yep, yep. Great. All right, um, I'm gonna get started then. Thank you, Martin. Um, this is a talk, uh, Attacks on NIST PQC Third Round Candidates. Um, I am Daniel Apon at NIST on the PQC team. Um, I'm the lattice guy, I guess, on the team. Um, this is a joint talk with my colleague, James Howe at PQ Shield. Um, so just as an introduction here, you know, first of all, of course, why do we care about attacks on PQC? Um, so this is a talk primarily, and in fact, entirely about side channel attacks against NIST post-quantum crypto uh, candidates. Um, so, you know, we at NIST have, have stated many times before, you know, going back to the initial call for proposals in 2016, and as recently as the uh, second round report, NIST IR 8309, um, that we're looking for more information, more research, more data on side channel attacks. Um, so, you know, just a just quote here, um, we're looking for more performance data on implementations that protect against side channel attacks, such as timing attacks, power monitoring attacks, fault attacks, this type of thing. Um, and I, I should point out just for context on this talk, um, why are we giving a talk about side channel attacks before there have been you know, large scale implementations of post quantum crypto? Primarily we wanna highlight this issue and point out for future implementers, uh, kind of the category of different issues they're gonna be you know, coming up when you're thinking about you know, deploying this for your business. Um, so with that, uh, we'll talk about a survey on uh, attacks on NIST PQC third round candidates. Yeah, so this part of the talk is is sort of the main contribution, really. Um, before we do that, we just want to give a brief prelude. Firstly, a quick overview of the attack types we consider. These include classical cryptanalysis and fault attacks, and then the typical side channel attacks that vary from um, timing analysis, simple differential and correlation power analysis, and electromagnetic template and cold boot attacks. We also provide any countermeasures we found. Uh, these can vary from masking techniques to hiding techniques. For brevity, we won't state the details of these, but you can look at our slides or, or pause the video offline for this. Um, and also a quick disclaimer, we tried to be as unbiased and neutral as possible here. And we only show attacks that target a specific candidate. So that would be a key encapsulation mechanism or a signature scheme. So this means attacks on a public key encryption or a key exchange version um, is out of scope. And we don't speculate about whether an historical attack or a potential attack supply either. We try to focus less on implementation foot guns as well, trying to show more on novel vulnerabilities. Um, so we assume um, as we can, tr we try to assume that uh, secure coding practices have been used. So we don't really consider key reuse attacks or non reuse attacks or anything like that. So without further ado, here is our main contribution. We did a complete and comprehensive survey of the current state of the art on NIST PQC third round candidates summarized here on the table. You can see the attacks um, we mentioned earlier in the columns. The rows make up the third round candidates. A check mark in the row will refer to the corresponding attack and an ordered references are provided in the final column of the table. Any gaps we have, any gaps we have here, we, we, we haven't found an attack on a candidate. <laughs> In general, most if not all of these attacks are academic, mainly because we've yet to see real world deployments of these schemes. Some vulnerabilities may have been fixed, but we keep the attacks uh, in the table for completeness and, and so that known weaknesses are remembered and mistakes are not made again. Most if not all of these attacks are also single target, and we've yet to really see the impact of multi-target attacks. This is something you might see in, um, for example, stateful hash based signatures. Lattices make up more than 50% of these attacks. This is unsurprising since it's been the case uh, since the beginning of the project for everything from software to hardware implementations. Although power analysis is the most common attack, there remains a lot of gaps here. This could be due to some schemes being infeasible to run on the typical embedded devices used to evaluate these side channel attacks. One, of, one example of this is classic McAleese. Also, some schemes such as Psyc or Sphinx Plus may also suffer from being significantly slower or larger in comparison to others, which makes side channel analysis significantly more difficult. Lattice-based schemes generally don't suffer in this regard. Even the, even the largest and slowest of these, um, Freddie Kemp, actually has the, mo the most attack focus of all. 
And as is generally the case, countermeasures are lacking. For CHEMS, Sabre is really the only candidate that has shown a full masking scheme. Although this was first order masking um, and would not be enough to protect against more advanced uh, power analysis, it will be interesting to see how this masking scheme scales for higher orders. And for signatures, the same is true for dilithium being the only mask candidate. Um, and this masking scheme covers higher order masking levels. Um, so yeah, now we go on to some uh, recent highlights. All right, so I'm going to discuss just uh, a couple uh, recent attack issues and some analysis just from the past few months. Um, so the first thing that I want to highlight here is this uh, work LWB with side information from Crypto20. Um, there was a uh, talk actually by uh, Ludacas on this, I think at the Simons Institute. He says, when a side channel attack fails, what can you still do with it, right? Um, so the point is that for a large number of the, especially the finalists in this third round, we're looking at lattice schemes. The canonical attack here is a lattice reduction attack. Um, this work proposes a new tool with uh, some kind of like script you can run to estimate things uh, to integrate hints from side channels to use in the lattice reduction algorithm. So for example, maybe you learn some partial information, you know, as on the slide here, um, about some coordinate of the secret key. Um, they consider four types of, uh, of hints, perfect hints, modular hints, approximate and short vector hints. Um, and the idea here uh, really want to you know, have people look at this is that these hints can reduce the BKC block size for your lattice reduction algorithm, making the attacks easier. Um, in terms of impacts in the future that this work may have, um, I want to highlight this can affect certifications of cryptographic modules, um, especially for certification processes such as common criteria, perhaps even FIPS related, you know, material. Um, some certifiers, at least historically for symmetric key crypto, require that you know some number of remaining key candidates exist, two to the 80, two to the 100, after a side channel attack is performed. Um, and if you can't show that is the case for all known side channel attacks, uh, you can't be certified. So this work will provide you with some mechanism, at least uh, you know a framework um, for a lattice, you know, Kim or even a signature scheme. Uh, for analyzing that kind of information. You can set your cryptographic parameters with those side channels in mind. Um, and that's something we're thinking about at NIST. Um, a separate issue um, is the difference between NTT-based multiplication and non-NTT-based multiplication. In particular, the cost of masking such multiplication operations over polynomials um, uh, for lattice chems. Here's the example. Um, the one thing I really want to highlight, if you take nothing else from this talk, right, is that we want to highlight that the the uh, the individual pairing choice between Kyber and Saber. Okay, this is not like a broad scale thing, but just between Kyber and Saber, they're so similar that it may come down, all else equal, to side channel attacks and masking efficiency and security. Um, so in particular, you know, there is a masked version of Sabre at first order. There's not yet a masked version of Kyber. Um, and also I'm going to point out as well that there was this recent nice work that showed that Sabre and Intru, which do not use NTTs, can actually ben benefit from kind of embedding the, uh, their, their algebra in a higher order ring, and then they can perform an NTT operation. This actually gives a performance speed up in the reference implementation. Um, however, you then have to specifically consider, um, at least, you know, I would suggest, uh, the cost of side channels. Um, this is also the case for signatures. I won't talk too much about this just for time's sake. Um, I'll just move on and say specifically that for Falcon, uh, masking floating point arithmetic is a major open problem. Um, and finally, in terms of recent highlights, uh, just considering active side channels, there was this work, Quantum Hammer, uh, against LUOB at CCS 2020. This didn't have a major impact on our process because there was uh, kind of a concurrent computational attack against LUOB. But you might ask whether uh, such active side channel attacks are more broadly applicable against the NIST PQC third round finalists. Um, and I will point out there's an upcoming work uh, joint team with uh, NIST PQC members along with the University of Arkansas that is going to attempt to do this against LWE chems. Um, and finally, we're just going to conclude with some takeaways for the future. Yeah, well, I think one thing we can say for, 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 for certain um, in the future is that implementation complexity of these standards will significantly increase compared to RSA and elliptic curves. This will in turn make simple implementation bugs more likely. Near the beginning of the project, NIST asked for the focus of implementations to be, about, to be around the ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller and the Xilinx Arctic 7 FPGA, uh, just to make comparisons uh, easier. 
However, for side channels, will these attacks or countermeasures we've seen in these devices be as effective on other platforms? Will there be more attack vectors and will we need more countermeasures? This is an open question. This complexity is also highlighted, heightened by um, the increase in these fragile or sensitive operations that have led to a large proportion of these attacks. Post-quantum also makes it more apparent how even simple um, isochronous or constant runtime complexity increases. This, is, um, this can be seen in a recent timing attack on random oracles um, in Photochem. But of course, some of these attacks will only be relevant if they fall into your use case. So be cautious of this, tailor, tailor the, rel the relevance um, of these attacks for your use case and obviously use secure coding practices. And to conclude, our main objective was to really motivate more attacks and analysis of these candidates. This decision may be decided by attacks or the performances of countermeasures. If your business is considering transitioning to post-quantum, it's definitely prudent to start this process now, considering the difficulties it brings, the complexities of the, and the new attack vectors they may include. Uh, thank you for listening. We're happy to take any questions now and offline via email. Right, so there, there are a few questions uh, on the chat. So um, the first one uh, is by Daniel Bernstein uh, asking, um, I think it's more of a complaint or a critique of like equating attacks on implementations with attacks on schemes because it assumes that the reference implementations were meant to be side channel secure. Uh, I'm trying to find the, the, the question in the chat. Uh, James, you can answer it while I look for it if you want. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find This it. is in the post-quantum crypto chat or in the... Yeah, lines? so let me read it out verbatim in all seriousness. I'm bothered by the way the overview slide at the moment ago equated attacks against software X with against against primitive Y. Of course, Photochem could be implemented better. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Um, Go yeah. ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, they've, they've obviously not been designed to withstand certain attacks, but also a lot of these attacks we've found are quite um, novel and sort of um, uh, they weren't expected, such as the the timing attack on the on the random oracle. I think not many people were expecting that. So I think it's yeah, it's also like it's an easy target, but also um, I think um, some new vulnerabilities can easily be found. Then let me just do one more question before we move on. Uh, so Dimitri asks whether fault attacks, uh, the existence of a fault attack signals anything uh, since he expects fault attacks are so powerful they apply to almost anything. Right, let me, let me actually answer this one here uh, just to kind of wrap up. Um, so in terms of side channel attacks, um, this has been kind of an issue that's come up here and there and we've highlighted it before at NIST. Um, now, if there's a category of attack that is only, you know, defensible in some ge completely generic manner, like, you know, make sure your implementation's correct, you know, add noise to your hardware, you know, vary your clock speed, that kind of thing. Well, that's, that's really outside the purview of NIST. However, um, it, it, it could still be the case that there are categories of side channel attacks that exploit a particular property of the algorithm such that uh, implementations of algorithm X1 and implementations of algorithm X2, um, it, you, you end up in a situation where uh, the implementation is, is, it's more convenient to have side channel resistant friendly implementations of the first rather than the latter. That's the most interesting thing. I mean, of course, research is going to continue on side channel attacks and defenses for, you know, days and years and decades. Um, but that's particularly probably the most important stuff. So that's what we wanted to highlight, I think, from this is that if there is a particular type of attack that distinguishes between candidates that are very similar, um, that would be useful during this next year uh, to provide you know, that information, that research knowledge to NIST uh, that could factor into our decisions. All right, so um, at this point, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Daniel and James using virtual applause of your choosing and let's move on to the next talk. And I actually don't know who's giving the next talk of the authors, me here, Hannah Felix. That would be me, Hannah. Hi, hi, hi Hannah. Uh, okay, so Hannah is going to talk to us uh, about how to instantiate your random oracles uh, securely, or at least how to not do it insecurely. So thank you, Hannah.
All right. Hi, my name is Hannah Davis, and I'm here today to talk about my joint work with Mihir Bilare and Felix Gunther um, on separating your domains, um, NIST PQC chems, and pitfalls in implementing random oracles. In the face of growing fears about the advent of quantum computing, NIST in 2017 put forward a call for post-quantum secure key encapsulation mechanisms, or CHEMS. Um, a CHEM is a cryptographic protocol used to establish a secret session key between two parties, and this key will be used uh, for, with some symmetric key crypto, like AES, so it should be completely hidden. One or more of these CHEMs will be the basis of the next public key encryption standard, so they've been the subject of a lot of attention and analysis by the cryptographic community. As we just heard, the process is now in round three, but even the round one candidates were heavily studied for over a year. In our own study on one of on the NIST PQC chems, we noticed something strange about um, a reference implementation of DAGs. We were looking at the ciphertext and the session key, and we noticed that they looked surprisingly similar, um, as you can see with the highlighted bits. Um, there's a lot of repeated information. And indeed, this chem is actually leaking over half of its session key directly through the ciphertext. Uh, Worse than that, this wasn't just one fluke in one chem. Uh, we found two other chems that had vulnerabilities that were extremely similar to this. And all of them were based on the same problem with implementing hash functions. Uh, the fact that none of these are round three chems, they're all round one chems, and none of them made it to round two without being updated, but uh, None of these attacks were caught during the entire year long round one scrutinization process. And we think that reflects a systematic oversight in the way that we're studying these chems. Um, we're not looking at the way that they implement hash functions and that's letting these attacks slip by. Um, so the reason that these attacks are arising is that many of the NIST chems call for multiple hash functions, say H1, H2, and H3. In practice, it's much easier for developers to use just one hash function everywhere. It seems like it should be fine, but it's actually a very common and serious mistake. The security proofs for almost all of the NIST CAMs assume that H1, H2, and H3 are distinct hash functions with outputs that are both random looking and independent of one another. These assumptions are normal, and we can satisfy the random looking requirement easily by using a cryptographic hash function like SHA-3. But when we use SHA-3, one hash function, to implement um, three hash functions like H1, H2, and H3, this clearly isn't independent. Um, the outputs are correlated, and this is what causes attacks like the one on DAGs. Um, in DAGs, the ciphertext and the session key were supposed to be the outputs of two distinct hash functions whose outputs would be uh, independent and uncorrelated. Instead, the implementation used the same hash function in both places, so the outputs were high, highly related and information was leaked. This surfaces a problem that we call Oracle cloning. We'd still like to use one hash function everywhere but since we can't substitute a hash function directly, we need some more careful way to build multiple hash functions that truly are, or at least look independent. An immediate reaction to Oracle cloning is, well, we already know how to do that. Um, and indeed there are methods that work well. The most well-known one is domain separation where we assign each hash function that we want to build a unique label, and then we use that label to prefix all of the inputs to the hash function. This is simple, it's efficient, and it's effective. But even though we theoretically know how to do Oracle cloning, in practice, we still frequently encounter both schemes that don't use domain separation, and as we saw, attacks that are arising from poor Oracle cloning choices. Furthermore, these attacks aren't being caught during the evaluation process, 
because they violate this assumption in our security model that our hash functions are independent of one another. All this says to us is that there needs to be a bit more attention paid to Oracle cloning. At this point, we have a number of questions about Oracle cloning. We know domain separation works, but we don't know what other methods are being used in practice or how well those methods work. We don't even have a rigorous definition of what it means for an Oracle cloning method to work. We'd like to provide a toolbox of good methods that we can be confident in for use in any scheme. And we'd like to prove that schemes using good methods are secure even after the Oracle cloning step takes place. Um, this would extend our evaluation process to cover Oracle cloning and stop these attacks from being missed. Our work attempts to achieve this goal in two steps. The first step is a catalog of the NIST CAMs where we looked through both their specifications and their reference implementations. Um, and we classified them into three groups, the schemes that we attacked, the schemes that use good uh, secure Oracle cloning methods, and an in-between group that we call brittle schemes. Um, from this classification, we extracted a list of Oracle cloning methods that appear in practice. In the second part, of our paper, we developed a theory of what a secure Oracle cloning method should be, and we used this definition to validate the Oracle cloning methods in our list. By doing this, we can prove security for all of the NIST PQC CAMs, except the ones that we attacked, uh, all of the ones in the latter two groups. And we can build up a library of proven safe Oracle cloning methods that will work for any scheme, not just CAMs, any crypto protocol that may need to use multiple hash functions where we would like to use only one. We'll start um, by going through our classification. The first group are those we attacked, DAGs, Big Quake, and Round 2. Um, I want to reiterate once more, these aren't round three schemes. They were eliminated after round one or updated after round one. Um, so none of them are candidates for standardization. But all, uh, all of the attacks that weren't picked up during the process are extremely fast. The latter two achieve full key recovery um, and they go much further than breaking the stated goal of uh, quantum INDCCA security. Um, and furthermore, all of these attacks are easy to fix just by using a good Oracle cloning method. And that's what we want to provide. Um, our second group of schemes are those that use good Oracle cloning methods in their reference implementations, and we can prove their security. We call them brittle though, because their specifications give ambiguous or flawed Oracle cloning methods. Whichever algorithm becomes standardized will likely be implemented many times in various cryptographic libraries, sometimes by developers with very little cryptographic experience. When the specification is unclear on Oracle cloning, we fear that such future implementations may perform Oracle cloning incorrectly. To improve clarity and prevent bugs in future implementations, we recommend that these schemes update their specifications to reflect their own reference implementations Oracle cloning methods. Our last group of schemes are those that did well with regard to Oracle cloning. They highlight the need for good Oracle cloning and discuss in their specifications how developers can accomplish it. From these submissions, we identify three good Oracle cloning techniques and those will form our toolbox. The first method in our catalog is output splitting. Output splitting works by partitioning the output of a hash function H into shorter segments then each segment becomes the output of one of the constructed hash functions. To use this method, the constructed hash functions must have fixed output lengths. In our example, 32 bytes. We've already discussed the second method in our toolbox, prefixing or classical domain separation. Um, this works well in almost all situations. We highly recommend it. The final method is the identity method, or just using the same hash function in all places. It may seem odd to include this in our toolbox, since this is the exact method we argued earlier was insecure. We present it here because identity can be used safely if the constructed hash functions will never uh, be called on the same input. The most common way to ensure this is by restricting the lengths of inputs to each of the constructed hash functions. 
This is one to be careful with, and it's not one we recommend, but it is used appropriately by some of the NIST chems. When we say these are good oracle cloning methods, what we really mean is that they're read-only indifferentiable. This is a security definition that captures the ability of the oracle cloning method to maintain the security of a scheme. If an oracle cloning method is read-only indifferentiable, then the, construction, the constructed hash functions can be used anywhere that truly independent hash functions could be used. Um, we use our own definition rather than the classical definition of indifferentiability in order to provide, in order to apply to a wider range of applications, including multi-stage games. Hannah, one minute. Yep. Um, so last slide. Um, the takeaway here is that domain separation is easy to get right, but it can be catastrophic to get wrong. Uh, but it, the, it's easy to fix. Uh, all we have to do is use a good Oracle cloning method uh, from our toolbox. Make it part of your specification. If you don't see an Oracle cloning method, use one from the toolbox that is appropriate for your hash function usage. Um, we've already seen one scheme do this, the round two uh, chem new hope, which you previously used a, not, a Oracle cloning method that was not read-only indifferentiable. Um, after we pointed out that we, our framework was not able to prove security for New Hope after the Oracle cloning step, they changed to use classical domain separation or prefixing. Um, and we were now able to prove security of their scheme without any additional analysis necessary. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to take questions now or over email. Right, uh, so thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, a fascinating talk. So first, there was some confusion on the chat about the term Oracle cloning on whether it's a defense mechanism or an attack, but I think that has been cleared up. Um, can you say something about uh, how amenable you're kind of like, so if I want to do static analysis of, uh, say, a code base and see if I have this problem in there, like how easy would it be to find it? Do I just need to grab for all the calls to SHA-2 or like what's my approach to find out um, if my code base on a higher level than a primitive has the same problem? That's a really interesting question. Um, certainly searching for all of the places where a hash function is used um, would help, but it isn't, the problem arises when a hash function is used in two places where the specification or the security proof expects two different hash functions to be used. Um, so for example, um, if you have, um, as in DAGs3, you have a portion of the ciphertext that is the output of say hash function H1 and a the session key is the output of hash function H2, you don't want H1 and H2 to be the same function or to be related in any way. Um, I don't think that static analysis would necessarily be able to catch, it would catch the first case where they're the same function, but there are more complicated um, versions where the output is related in some predictable way, but not necessarily equal. Um, so I would say, keep different names for your different hash functions and make sure you're implementing them with proper domain separation. And then static analysis isn't necessary. Carolyn asks, uh, is there any good reason to leave the Oracle cloning to the implementer instead of just mandating a specific scheme? <sighs> it's common practice to leave it up to the implementer, but I don't think there's a good reason to do it. Um, I think our, our hope is that people will start putting Oracle cloning methods into specifications and just making them a part of the scheme. Okay, great. So uh, for more questions, uh, kind of um, please kind of ask them on Zulip uh, because um, we are now moving on to the final talk of the session. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so the final talk will be uh, given by Jokta. Um, on the embedded challenge for post-quantum crypto. Thank you. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Yeah, my name is uh, Joppe Bos and it's my, really my pleasure to uh, talk at Real World Crypto and I hope we can actually do this uh, in real life soon again. 
So the last two talks were more about attacks on post-quantum crypto. And with this talk, I would really like to highlight, yeah, a different view and, and what kind of work we've done in this area, namely related to a, a embedded perspective of post-quantum crypto. So maybe let me try to um, yeah, kick off. Um, yeah, we saw from the very interesting talk uh, by NIST and the poll which was run. Uh, yeah, when do we believe if there will be a quantum computer or not? I think, yeah, from our perspective, it's really not that interesting um, when or if you believe that a quantum computer uh, will become a reality because the post quantum crypto standards are simply coming. And if your customers are asking for this, um, yeah, then you have to, you have to comply. Um, so you need to prepare yourself to actually migrate towards these new public key crypto standards. And, and that is the big motivation here. So when I say embedded devices, what do I exactly mean? Um, so for us at NXP, we mainly look at these four pillars, um, which you can see on the screen here. So first of all, there's automotive. So modern cars have a uh, hundred uh, or even up to a thousand different chips in them. And some of these chips need to securely communicate to each other. Then you even have vehicle to vehicle com communication where cars need to communicate uh, between themselves. And of course you want to do this in a secure manner. Then there's in industrial and IoT. Uh, many embedded devices live there. And of course they need public key crypto as well. Uh, there are the mobile applications. So think uh, electronic payment or uh, transit applications which need to be secured. And then of course there's our communication infrastructure. And with all these embedded devices, um, they already struggle to uh, actually implement in a timely manner uh, our current public key algorithms like ECC and RSA. And now they need to migrate away to more expensive in for some definition of expensive uh, public key crypto. So yeah, the big question is, what is the impact? And is this even uh, feasible in practice? So yeah, I wanted to highlight two use cases, but since this talk, uh, because it's virtual, uh, was a bit shortened, I will only talk uh, mainly about one, about the, the second use case. But the first use case, uh, I wanted to highlight digital signatures and where this is used. Um, so for instance, in ind industrial IoT and in automotive, uh, the first thing you might, uh, or it makes a lot of sense to make this post-quantum secure are your secure boot and your over-the-air update. Because if these two components are post quantum secure, you can use this as a vehicle to actually uh, upgrade the, the remaining part of your, of your product to uh, post quantum security. Uh, and we actually looked into this and we uh, yeah, advanced on, on a time memory trade-off technique, which allowed on embedded devices to actually make the signature verification, which you need to compute on the embedded device uh, significantly faster while still being compliant um, with these stateful hash-based signature schemes. And what I want to highlight a bit more is related to key exchange. So think again, use cases uh, related to industrial and IoT. Um, in these end or edge devices, you have a secure element which might need to communicate with your regular core, so your unprotected core, or uh, different IoT devices need to talk to each other. And for this, you need to uh, yeah, perform a key exchange. And the big question here is, is this even possible in practice? And what exactly uh, yeah, is the impact? So if we look at the, yeah, the NIST finalists, and I think they've been mentioned in the last couple of talks as well uh, for key exchange, um, and you look at the academic literature um, about implementations on uh, yeah, what is often called an embedded platform, a Cortex-M4, uh, I plotted some numbers here in blue, so for Sabre, Entrue, and Kyber. Um, and then in red, I um, plotted the numbers for an elliptic curve, a popular elliptic curve crypto scheme, so X to 55, 19. And you can see here the, the performance numbers. So there are two things to notice here. So first of all, the, the fourth uh, finalist, Classic Macalese, is not plotted here simply because, um, yeah, I couldn't find any uh, performance numbers on a Cortex-M4. This is probably something to do with that their public key uh, is massive, as was already mentioned by the talk by NIST. So it, uh, for the larger parameter sets, it's over a megabyte, which will simply not fit on the device. Um, and the second thing to mention is that from the remaining three lattice based schemes you see here in blue, the performance is actually not that bad. So they're really in the same ballpark as uh, elliptic curve crypto, which, which is kind of good news. 
On the other hand, um, it should really be highlighted that uh, a Cortex M4, although it's often considered an embedded device, um, yeah, for many of the applications which I showed in these four pillars uh, a couple slides back is really uh, considered high end. And therefore, the main problem is not really related per se with the performance, but it's really with the with the memory or the stack consumption. So here you can see so these same implementations, which were 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 really fast. I mean that's why they advanced to uh, to the final. And again, but now for not in performance, but for their memory. And we see for elliptic curve crypto, um, this is really convenient, and that is why um, elliptic curve cryptography is so popular in embedded devices. If we look at these other implementations, they're much, much bigger. So for instance, you can see one of these uh, goes over 20 kilobytes of stack. And here I also want to highlight this is even without considering the storage of the cryptographic keys, which are also much, much bigger than the, our current uh, public key crypto. And of course, there are many ways that you can try to remedy this. Uh, you can make implementations which look uh, use much less uh, stack. But then, of course, this comes at a cost of performance. So in practice, for these embedded devices, what are we considering? So often, of course, depending on your product, uh, on your product line and your use case, think about one to four kilobytes of stack, and that includes the storage of your keys. Uh, maybe eight if you're lucky, but 20 um, is definitely a real stretch and uh, will be a massive problem. So now, if we would find some sort of trade-off that you can trade some of your uh, consumed memory for performance, we again have the problem that how can we get faster uh, in this in this uh, case, lattice-based crypto. So of course, this is a well-studied problem for our uh, public key crypto deployed nowadays, and that's why lots of these embedded devices have coprocessors, um, and they compute the core of the public key crypto as we know it. Uh, so for RSA and ECC, this all boils down to uh, modular multiplications. So for RSA, uh, the modulus is a couple thousand bit. For uh, elliptic curve crypto, this is a couple hundred bit. But for lattice-based crypto, this is completely different. So now we, the core operation is uh, working with polynomials um, with integer coefficients, where the coefficients are small. They're only 16 bits. So if we now want to use the power of these arithmetic coprocessors, how can we proceed? So one idea, of course, and this has been studied in, uh, in 2019, is to use these large registers uh, pack multiple of these 16-bit coefficients in there, do one big large multiplications, ensure that the result doesn't overflow, that every, everything stays correct, and then you um, get a constant time speed up by processing in a, in a bit like a SIMD type fashion. And if you do this, um, actually, um, when you think about it, this is just Kronecker substitution. So this is a way how you can convert polynomial multiplication into integer multiplication. It's well known, it's from the 19th century. And with the team at NXP, we had a closer look at this. Um, and we actually looked at it not from a, from a point of view that it is any polynomial multiplication, but we specifically looked at the rings used in, in crypto. So, and the question was, can we do better? And the answer is yes. So the idea here is that you would use the, the roots of unity in this ring. Uh, and you build a symbolic uh, number theoretic transform similar to Nussbaumer, but different. Um, and although this method is slower when you would do it on polynomial multiplication, if you combine it with this Kronecker substitution by converting it into integers, um, you actually get a much faster method. So just to highlight for Kyber, if you convert your polynomial multiplication in uh, an integer multiplication, it would uh, turn into one uh, 8,000 bit multiplication. And now assume you have an arithmetic coprocessor uh, which works on 128 bit uh, words. You need roughly 4,000 calls to your coprocessor. Now, when you use this uh, uh, method uh, we proposed using the roots of unity and the symbolic NTT, it boils down to 16 512 bit multiplications, which you can compute only uh, with 256 calls to your coprocessor. So that's already a very nice speed up in practice. So to conclude, um, yeah, it doesn't really matter if you think quantum computers will be here soon or not. The post quantum crypto standards, which will replace our, our, our PKI inf infrastructure will come. And um, yeah, as industry, we are already preparing for this. Um, so we have these, the short-term standard, as you saw, stateful uh, hash-based signature schemes, and then, of course, the NIST standard. 
Um, and the NIST standard will make it even a bit more difficult because they will select multiple winners per, cat per category. So it means lots of extra work. And we didn't even talk about hardened implementations, but it's good that, that Daniel and James did this in the uh, two talks back. Um, that will be, I think, a major challenge for these embedded implementations where you need to actually protect against these types of attacks. And indeed, there, the, the table they showed was very interesting. Um, it showed what is done in academia, but of course it didn't show what can be done per scheme. So in that sense, I think any scheme can probably made secure in this model. The question is at what cost? So I think we have very interesting times ahead, um, especially for the, yeah, from this embedded perspective. Thanks a lot, and I will take any questions. Thanks for a great talk, Jotta. Uh, Chris asks, what makes Entru Saber use so much stack compared to Kyber? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, this was not an implementation I, uh, I made. So this was from the, one of the implementations submitted to PQM4. So you, yeah, you would want to ask um, the implementers of these schemes. The big question, of course, is, uh, is this inherent to the scheme or was this more memory used to achieve this, this high performance? And, and to me, that's not clear. And then uh, Thomas is pointing out that uh, upon the X25519, uh, listed as 0.9 cycles at, on the Cortex M4, it can be done in 0.55, but this uh, makes your point, uh, kind of doesn't change your point. And then James points out that classic Megalese was indeed opt implemented on the Cortex M4. Uh, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, so if people want to jump in real quick in the last minute that we have here. Okay, I don't see. Um... Oh, let me ask one. Uh, one of the problems that we had when we were kind of doing just chronic uh, uh, substitution was that schemes mandated the use of the NTT. Do you see that this is a long-term problem and would you kind of ask schemes to be neutral to the implementation? like? You know, like yeah, we actually, it, it, it's a very good remark. So we encountered the same uh, issue. Yeah, like we also remarked in our paper. So some schemes, they sample from the NTT domain. Um, so the NTT domain, so typically that's a schoen Strasse approach used um, on these polynomials directly. And of course, then if you would use Kronecker substitution, you need to first invert this uh, in order to proceed. So compute an, in, uh, an uh, backwards transformation and that indeed gives a yeah significant overhead so indeed so in some sense for the embedded devices which want to use this approach that is a very indeed an unfortunate design decision um, and it might have been better to just sample uh, yeah not in the NTT domain and make the high-end implementations uh, slightly slower but help the embedded devices a bit more that's definitely true yes okay so then Kevin asked the question Given that PPC is looking perhaps many years in the future, do you think this should change the economics of embedded systems to choose a higher capability core to handle the future? This is also consistent with auto companies who want to make their cars have a subscription service for future revenue. So I'm, I'm not sure if I completely got the question, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So of course, one, one direction you should go into is, is design new hardware specifically for uh, yeah, the winner of the NIST competition. The downside is we don't know uh, who will win. We don't even know, or it might be a lattice-based scheme, might be, might be a code-based scheme, and they need completely different hardware accelerators. So on the, and designing new hardware takes time. Um, so for now, to ensure that we have a seamless transition and that actually the currently deployed uh, embedded devices can run post-quantum crypto, I think it's important to look into the existing uh, yeah, hardware we have and how that can be utilized. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, this brings us to the end of the session. So thank you, Joppe, and all speakers of the session. Um, at this point, I'm handing over